And we are live for the Steelers Depot Monday live stream here on Monday, November 15th. As always, I am Alex Kazor. Appreciate you guys being here, hanging out with Dave and I, answering as many Steelers questions as possible. I imagine there are quite a few of them after the Steelers Week 10, 16 to 16 tie against the Detroit Lions on Sunday, pushing Pittsburgh to 5, 3, and 1. So again, if you're new here, Dave and I answering answering as many questions as possible. Feel free to send a super chat if you would like to uh, have your question be guaranteed to be asked and answered and move to the front of the line. Dave, how you doing? We need a, we need a, a entry song or something, don't we? Mm. <laughs> uh, ha- happy Alex and Grumpy Dave or something like that. Or uh, Facebook, uh, welcome to this week's f- Facebook. <laughs> 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 or, or YouTube, not not Facebook, YouTube live session there. Yeah, I'm doing okay. I'm just deep in the tape right now and getting, uh, you know, it's a lot worse than obviously the all, tw- I mean, than the, than the TV copy and all. Yeah, a lot to talk about, so be sure to stick with Steelers Depot for film reviews and just a full analysis of this game uh, throughout the rest of the week. So again, Dave and I here till the top of the hour, 8 p.m. Eastern time, answering your Steelers questions and a lot of news on a busy Monday, headlined by Minka Fitzpatrick, testing positive for COVID-19 and heading to the reserve COVID list. He could come back for the Chargers game. We'll miss probably most, if not all, of this week's practice, but uh, a path for him to return Sunday night, as is the case for Ben. So let's get into the questions here. And again, just how are you doing, Alex? (laughs) Hanging in there (laughs) day by day, surviving and advancing. Um, But uh, yeah, I had mentioned this for whatever reason for the YouTube uh, chats. They seem to go away on my end if they get like sent in hours ahead of time. So try to send them closer to, you know, after six o'clock, I would say. But uh, our first question comes from Mutated Genome, who says, would Spillane play any worse than either starting inside linebacker? At this point, I get the question because of the run defense issues. I think there's a lot of layers to why the run defense struggled, um, but I get the instinct for that. I, I will say I think Spillane's a lot more of a, a downhill player than Devin Bush, and I don't want to absolve Joe Schobert from this either. I think we focus a lot on Devin Bush, and some of that's rightfully so, but Schobert has not been particularly good either. So to answer the question... I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? I'm going to punt and pass it to you, Dave. I mean, what, what, what's the question? Basically, should they, you know, should they turn to uh, Spillane more? Essentially, yes. I mean, I, I would consider it, but I mean, at the same time, I mean, you've got a first round draft pick there that you're heavily invested in that, uh, uh, you know, you've, you've, you've got to hope can, can, can work through this, I think. And obviously a little bit more athleticism uh, than Spillane. Uh, uh, would have, and I mean, look, Joe Schobert, as you mentioned too. I mean, as we we see in the All Twenty Two, there's there's a couple of guys that that are in some wrong gaps, and and it you know it doesn't look like Schobert's uh, innocent throughout this game uh, as, as well. So I mean, I'd be more apt. I you know I don't I don't think you're not going to make it with that much of a positive. I don't think that that move and get that much more of a positive out of it. So I think you just try to get these guys to to stay a little bit later in the film rooms and. You know, hope, hope, hope they, they can get a little bit better there. So, you know, lo- short, short answer would be I would not make the change, but I would understand why people are asking because they're, they're not getting very good play from their inside linebackers yeah. at all right now. Yeah, I think that's that's a fair assessment of things. And the next question actually comes Well, several questions, as you might imagine, about Devin Bush today. One from John Pennington about Bush and a little bit broader as well it says, Hello, Dave and Alex. Do you guys think it's time to put Bush and Dan Moore on the bench? And do you think Green should be in this conversation? To the latter point about the offensive line, um, injuries may kind of force their hand to play in the guys who are just healthy and available um, to that regard. Now, of course, Zach Banner could come in and you could shift more parts around. Um, I don't think Moore played, on first glance, terribly poorly against Detroit. So I still would not make a move there. Green, I would not. And again, the interior injuries may not even give you that choice, even if you wanted to. And then with Bush, again, I'm, I'm a little mixed on it. Um, but I, I just want to at least make the point that, well, I don't think Bush is playing well. I think some fans and, and just overall the fan base is focusing too much on, on him as if he's the only issue. And he is certainly far from the only issue. Yeah, it'd be one thing if you said, look, that that is just him. But it's not. I mean, uh, the middle of that line has 
hasn't been good. Uh, as we mentioned, too, Schobert ha- has had his issues. Man, the tackling sometimes in that secondary hasn't been great. I mean, Minka hasn't been great back there when it comes to some tackling uh, either. And you don't, you know, Edmonds. I thought Edmonds had an okay game, you know, o- overall, mm-hmm. but he he wasn't, you know, totally uh, innocent in there. So, uh, it, it's it's more than just one per one one play here. And as far as more goes, I I thought overall, and, and just running through the uh, all twenty two the first time on the offensive side of football, uh, you know, as I said on the podcast this morning, the the TV tape, you know, obviously the 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 green snaps you know, weren't good. And uh, Green had some struggles there, I think, after that uh, first open and drive for a couple. But I thought overall that the unit kind of settled down. And uh, even when Haas and Hauer and, 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 and Joe Hay came in there, it, it wasn't off. They th- That line played well enough that they could have won that game, mm-hmm. uh, 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 you know, easily, I think, there. So uh, now, you know, we're, we're going to see what happens with the guards, with Trey Turner and Dotson and those ankles. I mean, there's, there's a very good chance that that, uh, those two guys might miss the game against the Chargers, and you know, then then what are you going to do? Uh, you know, more. Yeah, you'd like to have that holding call back, but uh, you know, how many times is the guy going to get called with his hands inside like that? You know, uh, I forgot to go back and look and see if you could see a uh, a serious tug there. The TV angle, I don't think, not so much. No, uh, there's a replay of that that should should give you a good view into that. I think. Uh, the, the well, one of the TV angles. I mean, you see the hand inside, but do you really see him tug him that much or no? I see him grab, but as I said on the you pod, see the grab, right. but you don't. I don't. Do you necessarily see see the 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 you know the the the, the tug? No, I don't. But whenever those balls, th- those runs bounce to the outside when they're not designed to, and the defender's trying to get outside and he's getting grabbed because it's supposed to be an interior run, those do get called quite a bit. So. I at least understand why it was called because the optics of it didn't look good. Fair enough. Fair enough. But I, 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 you know, look, I, at this point, you've got so much invested in more right now uh, over there. Uh, I mean, what, what's your alternative to switch and put Chicoma core for over there and then either banner or Hague at right tackle. You might not even have that luxury right now, depending on what happens with, with the injuries at the guards right now. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, to, the, the two most concerning things coming out of that game when it comes to the offensive line, I thought was the snaps by green and then the hold by more, you know, right. because the more, you know, that obviously cost you a touchdown uh, over there. And then uh, the green snaps cost you uh, definitely some good field position later in the game. That's for sure. For sure. And then just the injuries, the obvious elephant in the room with that offensive line. Uh, I, I very much doubt Kevin Dotson will play against the Chargers. Turner, I don't know, but I'd be highly, highly surprised if Kevin Dotson played against the Chargers. Did you see where Turner did? I haven't I haven't found where Turner hurt himself yet. I haven't. I saw Dotson get rolled up on. I saw that injury. And you're right. He tried to stay in the next play, which kudos to him. Right. He could not even he couldn't even take a step. He took one step and then he called himself off and took himself off the field. Right, and I think because weren't they trying to go hurry up or something? I mean, could, I, mean I, I don't even know as bad as it looked like it hurt him when he got off that field there. I'm surprised he even stayed on. But, uh, right. uh, yeah, uh, I, I would be – and the great Dr. Mel just put a post up on that not too long ago on the site there. So you can – people can read that if they'd like to. But uh, it, it don't look good for him for sure. Yeah, Turner, it might not have even been noticeable because I think it came – he didn't start the next drive. So it might have been something that he dinged and he gutted out, gutted it out during the drive and then uh, and then came off. So I'm not sure if that's going to be obvious, but we'll go back and, and see where it might have happened. Next question, again, Devin Bush-related question from Kevin A. Very disappointed in Devin Bush. We shouldn't pick up any option thoughts. I know Dave, you've been talking about that for a while, um, and I don't think— I got know. blasted for it at first, too. People said, oh, you got to give him time. and all. I mean, what, what, what do people want now? I mean, you know, he's got a half a season to turn it around. I'm not saying that he can't. So uh, a good thing is you don't have to make that decision right this moment. Right. So that's, that's the best thing about the whole thing is you don't have to make that decision right now. But— it it certainly isn't trending in the right direction for him. He really is going to have to turn around these sec, these eight games, and they need him to. If they're going to win, if they're going to win four of these eight games. It's going to be because they, you know, uh, 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 you know the, the linebackers play better inside. Right. Yeah. Uh, if if the, if the decision had to be made today, they would not be picking up the option. And as right. you said, he'll have to do quite a bit for that to change the rest of the season. Tim Chase says, my cardiologist says that I should change teams but can't. Wish me luck for the rest of the season. I'm going to need it. Um, Yeah, wishing your luck, uh, Tim. Wishing Steelers Nation 
luck as well as a question we'll get to in a second. Ghost slash 27 says, good evening, folks. How are you doing? Doing well. Thanks for being here again. Be sure to ask your questions in the chat below. Tim Chase says, because of the injuries, will they move green to guard and put Hassenauer at center? I doubt that, Tim. You don't want to move more people than you have to to replace one guy. Green, of course, played guard at Illinois, but has not played it here in Pittsburgh to try to do that for a rookie on the fly. I know Hassenauer is kind of more of a center than a guard, but uh, I think to be moving too many parts there. So either Hassenauer will go to left guard. I would even, if you have the option, assuming you do, put Joe Haig at left guard. I think he played really well at right guard. He's played left guard in the past, and I think he's just a bigger body, a better run blocker. So I would be interested in that idea. But uh, regardless, Green should stay at center. I agree. Yeah. You need you need him to get as much experience there as you can, and uh, you know a couple of games ago at least he turned a, a little minor corner there. So a, absolutely, you need to keep him at center. Yep. Uh, Tim Chase again says, "What does it tell us when Ray Ray is by far our best receiver Sunday? Hugely disappointed in Washington. Yeah, only well Washington did, did have six targets, of course had the touchdown, but um, it was a, a little man's game at receiver." And you were hoping for a big completion downfield from Rudolph to Washington. Again, you got the touchdown off of blown coverage, but um, you're disappointed you couldn't complete one of those vertical passes. Mm-hmm, absolutely. The, you, the, the, this team misses those explosive plays, man. Just yeah. two yesterday, three if you count the pass interference one, and uh, one of the other two was a uh, scramble by, uh, by by Mason Rudolph. Those Those kind of things I wouldn't think that you could count on every week. For sure, for sure. Yeah, Mason Rudolph, the longest <laughs> rush of any Steeler of the season, 26 yards. Kind of crazy to think about. Muhammad Al Ali. Are you, sur- are, are you surprised mm-hmm. by that? I that mean, he has I, the I longest rush? That, yes. I mean, that that is actually Mason, but the length, I guess. Um, I'm honestly not su- you're surprised it's him that owns Yeah, it, but, uh... I'm very surprised. I think Mason's surprised it's him. I mean, as you said, we had a discussion on the podcast this morning. You know, Najee Harris was not going to be a big play, explosive play runner, so I'm not. I mean, obviously, you'd like to be longer than you know 26 yards, and, and Harris is long. The season's 20. I think the second place is Claypool with 25. Um, but I guess do they I'm not have the shortest, that. longest was, run of the year? Uh, we can look that up. You may look it up now. I think I can do that right now. Uh, I just, I, if not, it's got to be close, right? I mean, they've got to be one of the one of just a handful of teams that don't have at least a run for uh, for, for 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 30 yards on the season Let's i would think find out espn and i assume these are updated through week 10 we'll see if pittsburgh's at 26 or not they are and no actually there's several teams that are lower atlanta with really? the shortest long at 18 yards yeah you'll see it on my screen here in a moment uh, atlanta 18 the jets 19 saints 23 bucks 24 dolphins 24 chiefs 24 steelers 26 so they're lower but not okay. not close to the bottom believe it or not all right are you surprised? I mean, the Buccaneers. I guess. Uh, I guess that's a little bit of a surprise, but they don't have really any hugely. Exp- I don't know. Uh, Ronald Jones. What, what's the status of, of Jones lately? Been? Has he been banged up or what? I can never figure out a Bruce Arians backfield. Um, right. I know there were trade like talks about him. For Nets been the like guy a- though. Belichick backfield right. sometimes. You don't know who's going to be the running back week to week. Right. Muhammad Al Ali with a five dollar super chat. Appreciate it. Says, "Hey guys, love the content. Why do people think that drafting a first round quarterback will automatically fix this team? There's going to be a lot of holes. I haven't heard anyone say it's going to automatically fix this team. I hope no one has that thought. But I mean, when you lose your franchise quarterback, your next goal is to find your next one, and usually that requires a heavy draft capital investment." in one so i mean predictably when you talk about the future of this team the post ben era people are going to gravitate towards trying to find the next franchise quarterback right and and there is no guarantees i mean look at all the first round first round quarterbacks every year and how many just fall off so i mean quick too i mean here we are just a few years removed from sam darnold and uh boy n- n- name them off i mean there are quite quite a few of them that, that that you know just because you pick them don't mean they're a guy and, and look i i obviously i i thought sam darnold back uh when he was a junior i can remember late in the season think man that kid needs to go back to school but in the same breath i i did like him uh coming out and i thought he was a first round quarterback uh for sure uh but I mean, just goes to show you, uh, you, you scout them one way and you get them into the league and, and, and get them up to speed and plan to get some of this other speed. And once defensive coordinators get a hold of them, start figuring them out, you see how things can, can twist. And I mean, Sam Darnold's really now at this point, I mean, he's close to, he's got one foot out of the league, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, one and a half, maybe. Yeah. It's real close. Yeah. One and a half. It's not far from, he's going to be, I mean, obviously the next step will probably him being a backup, 
Uh, but I mean, he's not. He's, he, his days as a as a higher paid starter are probably over with now. Yep, uh, it, it's tough. And yeah, there's no question that it is a at best 50 50 proposition in finding that next franchise quarterback. Pittsburgh, of course, did that with their roll of decks and names from the Bradshaw to Ben bridge there, which was too long of a bridge. But I it, tell it, you, you called Mac Mac Jones, right? You had a good pulse on uh, on yeah. Mac Jones. You know, you really did. Right. But, it, you know, it is only half a season. And so right. these guys go up and down so much that it is hard to judge. But, yeah, I was a big fan of Mac Jones, and he's making me look smart for once. Right. Uh, I didn't I don't think I had wasn't hugely fan of a lot of them there. But uh, and obviously didn't think the Steelers would draft one. And, and, and they did, didn't. But so far, Mac Jones seems like he's handling it OK. Yeah. Now, he is in the probably the best situation of these rookie quarterbacks as well. So that certainly does help. But, uh, yeah, point taken. Go slash 27. My only question, what was going on with our D line to make them so awful for most of the game? And how did they suddenly switch from turnstile to a brick wall at the end? A very good question. I'm going to do a video on that. It'll probably appear on Steelers Depot tomorrow morning before it even does on the YouTube channel, because I'm going to get it done so late tonight. And I don't want to post videos at like midnight or something like that. But, um, I mean, the, the, the short answer is that they were adjusting to the Lions motion in 13 personnel uh, better. They were not doing that well earlier. Uh, the, the Lions would take their six offensive linemen and, and shift them and motion them. And Pittsburgh's responses were, were kind of chaotic and poor and late and really caught them, you know, not being gap sound. So I know what Mike Tomlin talks about tackling being the number one issue for the run defense. To me, it's not the number one issue. It was an issue. But I think just from an assignment alignment standpoint, Pittsburgh was really poor up front, and it created a lot of chaos right before the snap of the football. It really did, and uh, you know, I, I know you have some quotes from Schobert and, and 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 Cameron Hayward on that from after that game as well, too. So I, I look forward to that uh, film room as well uh, in, in the morning because uh, I know you have the all twenty-two from it. Yeah, I just went through and I have a list of my goodness, like eight or ten plays to look at the good and the bad. So hopefully, I'll do the. Best I can to make it concise and pointed, but I don't always do a good job of, of, of the, the focus of the uh, the video. But uh, next question here comes from Dusk Thunder 9 I know the tie is disappointing, but in general, a tie is better than a loss, right? And is it possible for the tie to help us rather than hurt us? I mean, yeah, in, in the technical sense, of course, a tie is better than a loss, and you'd feel slightly better about tying the lines than you do losing to them. You'd rather be 5-3-1 and one than 5-4. and four. That's just objectively true. Um, is it possible the tie will help the Steelers? No. I mean, a win would have helped more. So, I mean, again, in, in tie versus loss, technically the tie is better, but it's it's only slightly better. Yeah, I don't find any positive in what happened <laughs> in Hinesfield. I, yeah. I, I don't find any, any positive in that. Yeah, uh, same here. Uh, let's see. Steelers freak. Are either of you willing to discuss that this team will need the off season to fully address its issues? I think we're willing to, to discuss that. Um, Dave, do you think, do you agree with the assessment this team needs the offseason to fully address its issues? Do they need the offseason to fully address their issues? Uh, in other words, to turn it around this year? Um, I think he's saying, I, I are, are, the, are, the, are the issues they're having fixable this year, or do they need new personnel this offseason to actually fix the heart of their problems? For example, I know you talk about the need for a burner on this team. That's probably something oh, yeah. that cannot be addressed until the offseason. Right now, I mean, you're past the trade deadline. You're, I mean, sure. what you have is what you have now. So, I mean, obviously, once you, you know through the draft and whatever, I mean, this team's never active, heavily active in expensive free agents, and I wouldn't expect that to change. Even if they free up you know, a lot of that cap money, they might go you know uh, slightly more aggressive than they normally do. But I, I don't, I don't think they're going to go out there guns and blaze blazing there. And you know, what what are you going to do at one of the cornerback positions with Joe Hayden if he's out of there? Uh, you're obviously going to have a, a, a hole at safety, right? You know, you, you, if indeed you lose a guy like Edmonds, uh, what's going to happen with Stephon to it, you know, uh, uh, past this season, what's going to happen with Tyson Alu, uh, Alu, Alu, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, he's still got one year left, but you know, uh, might they go, might that be, be it for him because of his age and all. And then, you know, look on the offensive side of football, obviously quarterback, uh, uh, James Washington, odds are probably good. He's not going to be back. Uh, Juju, there's a decent chance that Juju might not be back. So uh, that's a lot of stuff that you have to fix, you know, uh, building a list. And and don't forget inside linebacker on top of it, you know. Right. But do you think those issues, the Steelers' biggest issues, can they be fixed throughout the course of the season? Or are they so problematic 
and so unsolvable now that they will have to be addressed in the offseason. I mean, I, this team, at, I think at best is going to be a nine win team, you know, maybe, maybe 10, but they better, they, you know, they obviously going to have to win some games. No, I don't think they're going to fix everything okay. that they need to fix this, this season. No, I think, I think some of their bigger, I think some of the issues certainly can be fixed. I think the tackling, I think the alignment, the assignment standpoint, I think the offensive line play all are solvable this season. Um, so I might, I might disagree slightly on that. Certainly things like trying to find a burner receiver are not going to be fixable and solvable, but I think Pittsburgh is, is capable certainly of playing better than they currently are, even on this lossless streak. Next question comes from John Horvat. Hey, John. Uh, it says, hey, Alex, happy tie Monday. Yeah, that's, a, that's what it rings off the tongue. Uh, happy tie Monday. Noticed yesterday that Mason's throw seemed to not have a lot of zip on some of them. Seems he was holding back. Do you think he was playing scared? No, I don't think he was playing scared. I think his composure was actually one of the more impressive elements of his game yesterday, especially against uh, pressure and blitzes. Um, but some passes certainly did seem to float, but I don't think that's indicative of him playing scared. No, I don't think he played scared. I just think uh, he had some accuracy issues for sure. And, and touch issues. I don't know how much the rain played into that. I mean, they gave him an opportunity to kind of use that, I think as, as an excuse in a serious post game press conference, but he, he, uh, he wanted to take the bait, but he didn't, uh, in that, uh, there's a there's a good five or six throws, you know, obviously that he wants to have back. And I think the most the ones look, if you want to talk about almost interceptions, we could run a counter on Steelers dot com for Ben Roethlisberger and piss a lot of you off, you know, mm-hmm. by doing that, you know, uh, an almost interception that hits the ground is called an incomplete pass. All right. So, uh, yeah, he almost had a couple of picked off for sure. Uh, the one that, that you highlighted, Alex, later in the game, uh, just an unnecessary throw more than anything because of the down distance and, and, and portion of the game. Uh, you know, if you complete that, what do you gain there? All right. So uh, luckily that fell incomplete. So we just talk about it as an incomplete pass. Now the other throws that I, you know, he obviously want to get back the, uh, the one that he overthrew to uh, Belage that obviously was intercepted. Uh, the one that he skipped up to Ray Ray kind of reminded you a little bit of that throw over to the left side that really essentially got him benched a couple of years mm. ago against uh, Cincinnati, yeah. I think, uh, early in the second half of that game. That's what that throw uh, reminded me uh, or, or harkened me back to was where was the confidence maybe to drill that one in there uh, for sure. I mean, that was the most egregious miss that he had by far. I mean, it was something that a wide open guy that you don't that you throw it into the dirt on. I mean, I don't know how that how, how that can't be the most egregious throw, throw that he had during the game. And then the other one uh, I, I kind of view was that late. Uh, that that's that late slant and you and I talked about it on the podcast this morning saying well I can't wait to watch the all 22 on that you know it, it, it was a it was him and him and I think the blame both goes on him and Deontay I think I think he expected Deontay to keep on that same angle and not mm-hmm. kind of uh pause once that linebacker cleared his face there uh, and I think Mason expected him to, 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 you know, go up at the, at the angle there because that middle of the field linebacker has his back turned and he's walling off the other side. So there's no reason not for, for Deontay not to continue, uh, on the original angle. And I, I'm willing to bet that that's, that's what Mason was expecting him yeah. to do. And boy, if you look at going, you look at that on all 22, what happens if Deontay catches that one? Yeah, it might be a house call. I think that's what you had said, right? It sure looks. I mean, if not, that's 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 thirty, forty yards. You're in field goal range, I think. Yeah. Uh, that was uh, overtime. Was that overtime? Uh when was it, Alex? No, I thought I didn't put you on the spot. Yeah, I knew it was late. I couldn't remember if it was fourth quarter overtime. It was a third down play. I believe would have been certainly a catch, a conversion, uh, a big chunk there. I don't remember if that was overtime or late fourth quarter. I don't know yeah, I'm, that. I'm drawing a blank here. Pulled okay. I pulled up the well, play. I guess I got so much pulled up on my desktop right now. But well, let me just quickly go to the next question because I can answer it pretty quickly, and then we'll, we'll come back to that. Do you, John, do you agree though, from what you've seen, though, that that was that was a miscommunicate? Or if anything, it's a miscommunication between the two. That that uh, uh, that if you're going to assign blame, you probably need to assign blame to both of them. Yes, I think that's fair. Uh, Johnny Holder says, Alex, do you think the Steelers have any chance to beat the Chargers without TJ? I'm always hesitant to, you know, say um, 
no to those 100 percenters any chance there's always a chance but certainly it'll be that much tougher when, when arguably your best player your top two you know players not playing in this one and really the defense has relied on the play of its studs notably Watt and Hayward and to some extent Minka to, to be the guys on this defense the last couple of weeks and so when you lose one of those big guys you're relying so much on even more than usual um, your chances of course decrease man I don't I mean this thing this thing escalated quickly, didn't it? Didn't it? <laughs> Going into Saturday night, yeah. uh, you know, uh, all of a sudden you, you get the news that Ben Roethlisberger's on the COVID list, and then get into the game on 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 Sunday, and boy, they just started falling, didn't they? Uh, Joe Hayden, uh, both your guards, and then uh, boy, you see TJ grasping at his knee the way he did. You know, I, I think everybody. Uh, uh, you know, th- so far so good, obviously with the news, it doesn't look like it's season ending, but it might be enough to keep him out of this game. It's going to be tough to overcome that. There's no guarantee that Chase Claypool makes it back from that toe injury this week, uh, as well. And now what's going to happen with Minka, you know, uh, Minka on the COVID list, uh, is there enough time for him to clear? I mean, there is enough time, but will he clear, mm-hmm. uh, by, uh, by, by Sunday, who knows at this point? So yeah, there is a good chance you'll be without more than just uh, T.J. Watt in this game, and yeah, that is going to be tough to overcome. And of course, Ben no guarantee to play either. I think right. some people kind right. of assume he'll come back, but he's symptomatic, which is going to make that you know protocol lengthier likely. And even if he does, even if Mika comes back, you lose practice time, and I mean you know those are going to be obvious issues. And you're traveling, so you're trying to leave early. But if there's any silver lining, the Chargers aren't quite as good as we thought they were. They had a loss to Minnesota yesterday, so they're not playing lights out either. No one in the AFC is really playing lights out right now. Mm, C-Rex says, this defense is having major problems. This is shocking. Didn't expect this at all. I thought offense only would be our problem. I know Dave and I both expected this defense to take a step back, but when you factor in the injuries to to it and Alu-Alu, we expected those guys to be playing week one, and obviously you know those guys have missed all, if not uh, most, if not all the entire season so there was some of that to be unexpected just because of the natural course of the season but um yeah i think obviously this defense has to play better than it has uh alex i think that play that we were talking about was the third and three at the pittsburgh 48 with 437 left in the fourth quarter does that sound right that sounds right so late fourth quarter the game was tied at 16 so that could have could have won you the game regulation obviously that 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 one play probably could have uh put you right in field goal range right there to win it yeah. yeah, and I don't, I don't think the Lions were going to mount a comeback through the air in that game, considering <laughs> how terrible they were throwing the football. But uh, Dave, this defense taking st- steps back, obviously impacted by the injuries. But are you surprised by the level it, it's taken a step back of? You know, I, I. I thought they were going to take a step backwards this year. I wouldn't have thought it would have been in a run game to the tune of 228 or 29 yards like it was. I kind of envisioned maybe the passing game uh, uh, being, you know, being the main cause for them not, you know, being as good of a unit as they were last year. And that's what makes it even worse. I, I worse, I think, at this point here is, uh, man, you know, you give up 220 something yards to to a team that has a quarterback with an oblique injury that noticeably they did not want him to throw the football, you know, and you give up still that kind of yardage uh, uh, to just a heavy set personnel grouping on top of it there. That, that's concerning. So, yes, I did think that the defense was going to take a step back this season. I didn't think we'd be talking about it as bad as it was against the run on Sunday, and especially not to an 0-8 team at the time. Yeah, the run defense is surprising. But, again, when we entered this year, we all thought two would play week one or come back very early in the season. We thought, we obviously, Tyson Alualu didn't know he was going to miss, you know, all but five quarters of the season. And so those are two monumental losses up front that have certainly impacted this run D. Uh, this person, that's their username, says, felt like the plan was to feature Ray Ray, who isn't starting receiver talent, perhaps because Rudolph has had more time with him running scout team. I don't think it's because of that. I mean, you know, McLeod's role has been elevated post-Juju injury, and you lose Claypool in this one as well. Did not play in this game, so, I mean, eventually snaps have to go somewhere. I mean, McLeod was involved a good bit in the Jet game, which is kind of more... His speed and some of the passes were not always because he was the primary receiver, just how the play unfolded. So I think you couple all those factors together. Of course, it was surprising to see McLeod catch nine passes, but I mean, I don't know if it was the plan to feature him in the pass game, at least the way that he ultimately was. Ooh, I, I I didn't know we would see that kind of uh, the offense run through run through him the way that we did. I I got to give him this, and we talked briefly about this on the podcast this morning. 
Uh, that little fella took a heck of a hit over there on that uh, on that cover two hole shot over mm-hmm. on the sideline, and he hung on to it uh, uh, for sure. So uh, all he can do is go out there and di- and do what's asked of him, right? And you know he 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 did that. But start started the season. If you would have told me at any given point that Ray Ray McLeod would have led your team in receiving in any any, any given game, I would have told you something probably had gone as wrong as it has, you know, Juju out for the season and, and Claypool missing a game or, or, or something like that. So uh, once again, you know, I, I, I just didn't like that. It, it had to get to that point where the offense has to, has to run through a guy that's just not someone that I think defense is worried about going to kill him. Right. Tony battle. Badal Menti, I, I butchered that. Tony B, I'll say it that way. Mason did just okay, but two of our best players made mistakes. Johnson and Fryermuth. that was the game when it came clutch time. Yeah, I mean, I think Rudolph was below average, but I'm not going to get into the, the semantics over about his performance in that comment. Um, you had you know, two overtime turnovers. The fact that you turned the ball over twice in overtime and you did not lose is a minor miracle, but that robs your ability to, to of course, win the game. And if you don't have fumbles there on either of those plays, you have a chance at least to kick a field goal. And with the way Boz is kicked, you have a good chance to make that field goal and win the game. So, yeah, those were incredibly costly plays. Look, make sure you you, you, you evenly distribute out the blame for this one. I mean, this was as good of a team law or team tie as I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. And I haven't seen many of those, right? Uh, I mean, we talked about the run defense in here. We talk about uh, 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 Mason missing five or six throws in this game. Uh the turnovers. I mean, I, I went back and I, I couldn't stand it. Alex, I had to look at pro football reference and find out since Mike Tomlin became head coach, how many times there's been exactly a turnover ratio of three to zero in a game. And how many times the team won with the zero, you know, with the mm. zero takeaways uh, in there. And it's like 20 something times out of what did I put 200 and something times. So the fact, and, and the two of the times that, that, that uh, bucked the system with a three and O turnover margin, the Steelers were two of those times. Oh, really? when you go figure. Yeah. Uh, 2000 and Oh, what did I put 2000 and one time against the Packers and one time against the Titans. I forget the, uh, the, the, uh, the specific years there, but uh, the fact that the Steelers managed to get a tie in that game, losing the turnover battle three to nothing was, was quite, quite the accomplishment just the same and boy if you just have one less turnover in that game you probably win it right Mm -hmm. yeah especially if you if we could magically wave our wand and say those overtime fumbles one of them did not happen now with fire moves i don't let me ask you this if fire move does not fumble there do they get another playoff is there enough time that's a great question I, i i don't i don't they have to spike it. They don't have time to get the field goal unit out there. So yeah, it's a question of do you have I, time to spike the football with eight seconds? I, I don't know. I don't know. Prob- I don't know. Maybe there was more know. than eight. I'll have to go back and 10. look at that. Yeah, I mean, it was about eight to ten seconds. I think you probably I, – I felt like they had a chance to spike it maybe, yeah. They had a chance. I mean, there was a chance, but do you think they actually get it off in time? I, I don't know what the other routes on that play were. I don't imagine there was someone running deep downfield, but I don't know for sure. I haven't gone back and watched that play yet. Uh, per pro football reference, since 2007, Alex, there have been 278 games. If I used all the filters right here, uh, you're a pro at getting around. Yeah. You're taking my stats of the weird over there. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I do wish they'd make those drop down. Maybe sometimes it's like, it's like uh, trying to read a foreign language to Mm -hmm. go through all those there. And I try to bookmark certain ones thinking that I'll go back to them and I'll forget where my bookmarks are, what they, what they, you know, what they're bookmarked in there. But since 2007, there have been 278 games. That sounds about right. 278 games that have ended with a exact three to zero turnover margin. Uh, Only 25 times did the team with the zero takeaways win the game. Wow. And Pittsburgh. 24 out of 278. And the Steelers are responsible for two of those since uh, 2007. How about that? Mr. ABS says, I thought it was 15 seconds left on that play. There was 15 seconds on the snap of the football. By the time it ended, there were eight seconds left with a running clock there. If he doesn't fumble, you get about eight seconds by the time that play is kind of done and guys start getting up. It's really tight. It's really close. Could they have done it? My guess is yes with a second left, but we'll never know, obviously. What was the timeout? Uh, uh, the Steelers had used their second timeout after 
36 seconds, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, and they had used it on before the Lions field goal. I think Tom went to ice the kicker, right? And so that was something in hindsight you kind of wondered, should you have done that? If I'm remembering that situation correctly. I'm trying to figure out. Uh, you, you say they used, okay, timeout number one uh, at 4.08 of overtime. And that was prior to the Lions 48 yard field goal? Do you uh, yes. Okay, so Tomlin did ice it. And obviously, you don't, I mean, you never know. You can't, yeah, you can't, you know, it do, does no good to, 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 to have the field goal kick or make the kick and you hold on to it right. in your pocket there and not have the But there is the question of does icing even work? And I think there's a lot of debate about this t- calling a timeout in that situation even impact the kicker, which is, I think, up for debate. Okay. Uh, Matt Nagy, for example, did that sec- against the Bears and he probably should have had that timeout back. Right. Right. And they used their second. When with 36 seconds left? Uh, looks like uh, at 29 seconds left. Okay. Gotcha. After after the play at 36, uh, Rudolph passed short to uh, Najee Harris uh, to the 49 for seven yards. Timeout number two by Pittsburgh. Okay. Rob James had a comment deleted, but he says, makes me appreciate Ben that much more. I assume that's in reference to the play or lack thereof of Mason or the offense in general. And yeah, I think um, Ben's had a lot of problems this year. Ben has not always played well this year, but if Ben plays that game, they win that game and probably do so in regulation. Next question comes from John Horvat. Been reported that Tomlin doesn't want to start with a rookie quarterback next year. Are there any prospect exceptions in the draft that you think might cause him to reconsider if they fell to pit? I have done extensive search, Dave. You've done more, so I'll let you have the floor. But, but to answer the question, simply probably not, John, at least not in Tomlin's eyes. Yeah, and I mean, I'm just, you know, surface. I know more about, obviously, Carson Strong and Kenny Pickett than I do any of these kids right now. Uh, I mean, that's more. That's, that I'm further along on, on any players right now than I normally am in any years. So, uh, but I'm not at the point where I say, this guy's this, bang the table. I, I will say this from... From the from and I have watched all of them at this point, all the top ones. I don't know if there's anybody I'm standing up on the table for right now uh, and and jumping up and down for in the first round, to be honest with you. And that includes Carson Strong, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, I don't I don't know I don't I don't see one or I I haven't seen enough tape yet that lets me think that any one of these quarterbacks that a team would draft that you throw in there week one and roll with, you know, and expect positive results. Yeah, I'm definitely, with you. definitely not, not, not to the degree of of what the Patriots have gotten out of uh, uh, out of out of your boy Mac Jones so far. Yeah, and I don't think it's gonna change Tomlin's mind enough to fall in love with a guy that he thinks can be the guy right away. Tomlin has very rarely worked with rookie quarterbacks. You look at his whole history at Tampa. They had Brad Johnson. The same with uh, his one year in Minnesota. They were, I think, starting Brad Johnson again. Actually, they played the the late Tavares Jackson in that year. He was really struggled, obviously. And so I think whenever Tomlin's been around those rookie quarterback situations, stuck in 19, it has not gone well. He has not had a you know first round blue chip prospect to work with, but that may just have clouded his judgment because his history is working with veteran quarterbacks and, of course, working with Ben, his Steelers' entire career. He's always been around known, established guys. And I still think people still forget way back when Ben Roethlisberger was drafted too that the plan was not for Ben to play uh, his rookie season really at all. You know they they were going to go into that season with, uh, with 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 Maddox and Charlie Batch and you know Batch obviously went down uh, went down with the knee injury during the summer there and and uh, moved you know moved Ben up to number two and then you know obviously get into that what was it the second or third game with uh, uh, Maddox injuring that elbow against. Uh, Baltimore, there you go. I mean, Kevin Colbert has made it known several, several times in interviews that the plan initially was to sit Roethlisberger his rookie season, and they might not have even drafted him had not, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Rooney had stepped in and said, look, you know, you know, sometimes you can't pass on some of these talent, talented kids there, and because they were going to who, who was the uh, who was the, uh, the, the Sean, kid that went to the Sean Andrews, Sean, right? Wasn't that who they were mm-hmm. kind of set on? It's a power one, yeah. At, you know, at, at the time. And, uh, uh, so look, I mean, I, I, they obviously did their homework on the quarterbacks that year and they knew who Ben Roethlisberger was and all like that. But, uh, just, just merely drafting one, you know, to answer the question, 
from where I sit right now, I, I will be pretty surprised if the Steelers draft a quarterback in the first round. Not saying they won't. There's still a lot of time to look at a lot of these kids and all, but that Glazier comment on Mike Tomlin, I believe it for whatever it's worth. I don't know it to be for true, you know, 100% certain, but I, I, I do believe it. I believe it as well, given how close of a relationship Glazer and Tomlin have. But if that's Tomlin's philosophy, well, when do you draft a rookie? <laughs> you're going to have to, unless you just think you're going to find some guy along the way that's going to become your guy. But you're going to have to fight that bullet at some point. I, I think you. I think you, what happens is it's a situation sort of like it was with Roethlisberger, where you get in a situation and you, uh, you, you, there's, a, there's just a kid that you can't pass up. Uh, and you go, you take them with the idea that you, you're going to try to develop them and not necessarily as a rookie right. and then go with a vet, you know, like the Steelers were going to do with Tommy Maddox that year. I, I that's the way I kind of envision this thing going down whenever they do the next time they draft a quarterback in the, mm -hmm. in the first round. So yeah. I think that's fair. I think not to be, to be careful parsing the language, but. Glazer said that Tomlin did not want to start a rookie, not that he wouldn't draft a rookie. Okay. He could draft one, and, and as you said, the goal for Ben was to bench him for a year, and the way that Mahomes did in Kansas City with Alex Smith, the way that Rodgers did with Favre, et cetera, et cetera. And so I don't want to say they can't draft one, but Tomlin does not want to start a rookie day one. And it was my interpretation of the comments. You know, a lot of these franchises, too, and these head coaching staffs and, and general managers, they don't have time to be patient with, 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 with quarterbacks, especially if they get one in the first round, because two bad seasons and they might be out of a job, mm -hmm. you know. And that's why you, there, there's always the rush to get this next this next kid going, you know, uh, draft them and get them in there and all. And I don't think that's always good, uh, uh, you know, for, for, for it, it obviously depends on the player and all like that. But at least with, ste with the Steelers, you have stability in the coaching staff that and general manager where, you know, if you think the kid really needs to sit, you don't have to start the clock on him right away just because you feel like you have to start it. To, to save your job, if you know what I mean. So right. uh, whenever they do, whenever the next time is, whether it be 2022 or 2020, whatever the next time they draft a, a, a quarterback in the first round, I don't think that 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 kid would be a week one starter. Agreed. 100% agree. Unless there's a Ben injury, you know, the, the way it was for Ben in 04. And obviously he did not start week one either. John Pennington, Dave and Alex, how long? Oh, will... oh, oh, just wait, get that Manning kid. <laughs> Oh, uh, no, the kid in high school, right? That's going to yeah. be a fresh. Where's he going to school? Is it Tennessee, Ole Miss? Where do you, can he pick a place or, or not I, yet? I don't know if he's picked yet or not, but uh, okay. he's been all over the place. Everybody's clamoring for him, and I guess with good reason, too, you yeah. know? John Pennington, Dave and Alex, how long will this new quarterback, speaking of quarterbacks, the Steelers signed today last on the practice squad. He has an arm at least. Yeah, that's James Morgan from FIU. Probably until that room is COVID clear with Ben and potentially anyone else there. Um, but but Ben's certainly the main focus. They won a third quarterback, so maybe a week for James Morgan. How do you uh, – what do you think about all this uh, Twitter buzz today about Dwayne Haskins? Ugh. Of all the things to talk about coming off a game against the Lions, the discourse is Dwayne Haskins' warm-up passes. My God. I feel, I feel bad that we're even discussing yeah. this. Yeah, I mean, it's like uh, 73 other issues to talk about, and somehow that's one of the top – three stories of the day. Um, I don't know. I wasn't there. I, wasn't I, there I, I think it all sounds a little silly, it, but, but it does sound silly. I'm ashamed that we're talking about it, but I figured I would bring it up. Yeah. Um, I hope I don't want to write about it. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if Matthew's writing about it in the morning or not, but I mean, we talk about some non stories here. Uh, I don't know. Again, I wasn't there, but if a guy's looking at his phone, I mean, to, to change his music or something, I, I, I don't think that's a sin. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't think it is. Uh, let's see, Jason Bo. Oh, how do you say that? Um, Bodine? Is that, did I get that right? I'm forgetting. But I, but Jason says hello, Daleks. What's with 53 in the high snaps? Referring to Kendrick Green. Seriously though, with Minka down, do y'all expect more nickel dime against the Chargers? Quarterback Wilson 2022. I'm not sure who that's supposed to reference. Quarterback Wilson 2022. Um, Russell Wilson. Maybe. I don't know. Um, Green with the high snaps, I don't know. I don't know if that was an issue of him being used to snapping to Ben, who's a little bit taller, or if they were uh, you know, against blitzes or head up uh, was a nose tackle. I don't know what the uh, relationship was or just, just bad snaps. I, I, I do not know. Um, nickel and dime will be dependent, generally speaking, based on what the offensive personnel is and does, not so much on 
the specific personnel Pittsburgh has, at least to, to the degree you're talking about, Jason. Uh, Pat Boy Savage, I got questions. Steelers are winning the Super Bowl. There's no question mark there. It might be more of a comment, but um, Dave, what do you think about the Steelers' Super Bowl odds? Uh, what year? <laughs> <laughs> not, that, not this year, that, right? That answers it well. Uh, yeah, I'm with you. Uh, even I'm in, going to go out on a limb here and guarantee you the Steelers will not win the Super Bowl Ooh. this year. How's that? That's uh, big money you're going to put on that, I'm, I'm guessing. But uh, yeah, even in a wide open AFC, this team can be competitive and they, they can get in the playoffs. But uh, do I see them going to a Super Bowl, winning a Super Bowl? No, I do not. There's there's nothing on the tape or the analytics side yeah. uh, that, 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 that tells you this team will, will be there uh, for the final game in L.A. Excuse me, Zachary Prosba, uh, good to hear from you. At this point in the year, which path do you think the Steelers take in 22? Keep Ben and build around him through draft and free agency or draft a quarterback in round one and fill other holes and such as you can. It may be neither. The most likely one is probably the second one about them drafting a quarterback because Ben's probably not coming back. Even if the Steelers would like him back, he probably wants to just end up retiring. So I'm not going to say there's no chance, but I'm still working on the assumption Ben is not going to be a Steeler next season. Yeah, I mean, never say never, I guess, but uh, I'll be surprised if Ben's back in 2022. You know, they need to bring in Matt Mummy, and they need to run, <laughs> they need to run the air raid, and they need to go out and get maybe a guy like uh, uh, Mariota or, or, or something, one of these the middle end that still has arm strength that has the uh uh the mind that can that can process running the air raid and stuff like that 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 that's what they need to do uh, i think it has a potential of being a very neil o'donnell like mm. uh uh situation i guess if any of you listening are are old enough to remember that uh, it does feel like even if they did draft a quarterback uh now look from where we sit right now this this obviously can change People are not going to want to hear it, but everything's still on course for Mason Rudolph to still be at least the week one starter. Uh, now, what you do or don't do in free agency will go a long way in, 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 in moving the mark there. Obviously, if they go out there and get a middle of the road or expensive uh, quarterback, then that quarterback would be the week one starter there. But uh, uh, if they were to go out and for some reason draft a quarterback in any round, or, I mean, you know, really that, 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 you know, I, in other words, I would be prepared, you know, for, for Mason Rudolph to be the week one quarterback, you know, unless they go out and, and make some sort of a splash in free agency. So is there a veteran quarterback you have in mind that you would like to see? I mean, besides the Wilson's and the Rogers and those guys, but is there a more realistic option? Like for example, I could see them signing Mariota. I would not really want them to just because he can't stay yeah. healthy. And, and you're, as soon as you sign him, you go, okay, what's our plan B? Because I know right. any quarterback can get hurt, but like with Mariota, you're, you know you're going to you're gonna have to turn to somebody else at some point that season. Yeah, uh, and, and I hear you. You know, And look, I mean, I know you've been high on Brissette, but uh, that that guy get a little bit up up in the tooth as well too now. And Up uh, in the tooth? I mean, long in the tooth. Oh, long. Uh, Is he old? Long, uh, Jacoby's on uh, – how old is Jacoby now? I uh, like 28, 29. I mean, for a year, for a stopgap. I mean, I'm, I, the age doesn't matter to me a whole lot. I, I'm not even that high on Brissett. I mean, I just think he's a bigger guy, kind of in that mold of Ben to some degree. And you work with Canada at the uh, NC State. And just, so I'm just kind of reading tea leaves there that Canada knows that guy, has had success with that guy, and could bring that guy in. I mean, to be honest with you, I haven't given a hard look at the court, potential quarterback Same. free agents next year because we've got so much other on our plate right now. But uh, let me pull up some of these names here that potential, I guess, uh, free agents here. Tim Chase says Andy Dalton, the Red Rifle. I'm going to pass on that. I, mean, I don't know what I mean. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't go that route. To me, the big names are the Tyrod Taylors, which I think makes a lot of sense. Good leader, good guy, um, mobile. He's had injury issues as well, but um, I, I think Tomlin would like him. I think he's a almost a 757 guy as well. He's, a, I think, a Richmond guy. Um, Mariota and Brissett are the names that make the most sense to me. I mean, Bridgewater, I think, is going to be unrestricted. Uh, yeah. Taysom Hill, Dalton, Ryan Fitzpatrick, Cam Newton, Tyrod Taylor, Jameis Winston, Jacoby Brissett, Marcus Mariota, Joe Flacco, Mitchell Trubisky. Uh, I mean, we're getting, we're, we're starting to, yeah get into the bottom of the barrel here. Uh, now th that's, that's about the list right now, you know? 
Yeah, it's it's uninspiring as it should be. No one's supposed to get super excited about it, but that's just the reality of the situation. And then you know everybody will ask, well, what's going to happen with Russell Wilson and, and and Aaron Rodgers? And look, I don't know if you saw how much of that game you saw of Seattle and Green Bay. <laughs> Neither one of those two were completing the football uh, much past as far as I could fall down past the line of scrimmage. <laughs> you know, yeah. so. Todd Williams says Deontay played terrible. Bush is a liability these days. Agree or disagree? I don't think Deontay played terrible. I think there was the fumble, which was 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 a terrible play. I don't think he made a, a terrible game overall. Uh, then there was that miscommunication on that slant, which again you can probably put blame half and half on that one. Uh, Bush, yeah, I'd say is a liability, but uh, I would disagree more so on Deontay's commentary there, Todd. What was the comment about Deontay? It says Deontay played terrible. I mean, he didn't. I mean, it obviously wasn't his best game of the season, you know, for 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 sure. And that fumble was was a huge and uh, a huge part of part, you know, huge play in that game for obvious reasons. I mean, I don't think it was his worst game of the season. I mean, he's had some of those drop games, you know, uh, piling up those drops there. I mean, it, it, it's not going to go down as one that he wants to uh, get a copy of the DVD or anything. I don't think it might have been his worst game of the season just because his other games were pretty good. I don't know if there was one that was worse, but I don't think he was still terrible in this game. He was not was, good. Was that a drop? Was that a drop over there on that right side? It had to it hit him right hands. I mean, the defensive back did play a nice, did did play it nicely and try to you know, play through the pocket and all. But but uh, Deontay was, you know, uh, a full head above that guy in the air with two hands on the football. The one that was a little high over his head. Is that the one you're talking I mean, about? He, he had both hands on it over yeah, his head. I'm just trying to think about what the play is. I'm, I don't, I'm trying to recall the play. Um, yeah, probably. I don't know if he got charted as a drop for that, though. At least I don't think PFF did it for whatever that is worth. Uh, Tim oh. Chase, to ask your question about the changes to the defense, check out a video on Steelers Depot tomorrow morning. I'll explain that. Still kind of working through it myself. Raymond Rack says, what do you think of the special teams play during the game? Boss was great. Still just too much, too much inconsistency, too many issues with this unit across the board the last couple of weeks. And so Danny Smith has to clean that stuff up for sure. Yeah. They didn't give him a drop for that either on PFF. They gave Pat Firemuth two drops. Two. They gave, two. yeah, they gave, they gave him two drops. What was the second? Uh, the first was the the one in the flat and in, in overtime. What on earth was this other one? I'm trying to remember. I'm just reading them off here. Two yeah. and uh, Caden Balage. They obviously that one went right through his hands. So that was a, that was a drop. Uh, I'm trying to remember where, what they considered a second drop, unless they considered that the, the fumble, uh, but that's, I mean, it's clearly a fumble. So right, but I don't know where drop. they, I don't know where they get the second drop from there. Me neither. A uh, couple more questions before Dave and I wrap things up. Appreciate you being here. A couple people talking about the need for a nose tackle. Yeah, I get that. Um, not gonna, no one's coming through the, through that door though. I mean, it's, it's week 11. No, no one's, no one's right again. There's no cavalry coming to, to solve it unless, you know, Tua gets back healthy. Obviously he's not, a nose tackle. Carlos Davis coming back, but he's not great against Tehran. He's more of a you know pass rusher, which they do need and, and could certainly use. Uh, Russ Obenstein says, what's going on, Alex and Dave? Misery Monday. Yeah, hey, Russ, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. And Bill made a good point about uh, the timeout comment I made about uh, overtime earlier. Tomlin didn't just ice the kicker. That timeout also stopped the running clock to give time for the offense. Fair enough. I get that point. Thank mm-hmm. you, Bilbo, for the, uh, the, uh, the point there. Uh, let's see. A couple more questions. Trying to find one. Tim Chase, anyone remember the Kent Graham days? Yeah, who's your favorite obscure Steelers quarterback of that Bradshaw to Ben era? Kent Graham's a good good pull there, too. Luckily, I used a lot of drugs during that. Uh, <laughs> okay. during, during the- <laughs> Coming in hot there. That's the first thing like that response to my question about. Yeah, thank God. For, thank, thank God for heroin. But, uh, <laughs> okay. oh my God. Uh, I mean, it's hard to believe that. I, you know, I was at uh, the game. One of the. Uh, the first game that they played in Jacksonville, uh, that uh, I forget what what year it was. It's there, the but Greg it was Lloyd a game one. that the Greg Lloyd game that he okay. injured his knee and went down there uh, on. And uh, uh, I, I did see a preseason game with Kent Graham in it as well too. Uh, a lot of people don't remember it. Sonny Bono, uh, uh, I mean uh, Steve Bono, Sonny Bono. I'm I'm really showing my age there. <laughs> that's that's a drugs really working from years ago Sonny Bono Steve Bono was at one time uh mm. what Todd Blackledge wore a Steelers oh uniform yeah. at, 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 at one time there yeah let's let's not let's not try to go through that again yeah for sure I apologize Mark alone I, yeah mm. Brister uh, I I missed a super chat here from Jonathan Mason so I apologize I'll get to it right now five dollars super chat thank you so much Jonathan you're always in these chats so certainly appreciate it he says as a big devin bush fan it's perplexing to see him be a spectator or just playing slow to the ball what gives seem like it's a lack of one two 
Yeah, I know someone asked earlier about the um, lack of effort with Devin Bush. I don't see that. I, it's very rare that I, I say that someone has poor effort or, or a lack of want to. I think that's really hard for us to try to quantify. Um, but he certainly – he's just not as instinctive as a Ryan Chazier or a lot of the Steelers linebackers have been over the years. And he's, he's got to play downhill more. I got a clip I'm going to show when I can probably tomorrow of him backing away from a pulling block. I think the, the tight end pulling around, he takes a step backwards, man. Mm. You're a Pittsburgh Steelers off-ball linebacker. You got to play downhill. You got to play physical. I know he's not, you know, a, a Farrier or a Kirkland type of build, but you got to be a downhill physical guy, tack those blocks, and I it just instinctually, it just it, it's not where it needs to be. People got mad at me for pointing out around draft time how he wasn't a huge playmaker on stops, but you know, at or behind the line of scrimmage, and especially if you look at his production against Big Ten teams during his uh, during his college career. It wasn't there, you know, uh, and Alex and I probably two, two of the better podcasts we've ever had together uh, were spent talking about uh, uh, college film of Devin Bush there. So, uh, yeah, him him potentially not being a huge playmaker. I mean, we definitely, you know, Alex say, well, did you go, did you see this side, you know, side to side in, in speed? And yeah. I mean, I saw, I saw traits that got him drafted from an athletic standpoint. Uh, I still come time, you know, that, that the pick was made. And, and after Alex and I had our powwows that there was part of me that was wanting, where is the playmaking at, you know, other than that, that sort of sideline to sideline stuff. And here we are in his NFL career right now, and it's still you know relatively early. But you better start seeing, as, you know, as Alex said, you need to start seeing that downhill stuff, those game changing behind the behind the line plays, or the uh, the robot uh, you know, Ryan Shazier robot uh, uh, coverage, where getting in a spot and intercepting a pass and that that kind of stuff there, and we're not seeing that with him. Now he did make a good play a couple of weeks ago on that interception. What against the Bengals? Kind of drop middle of the field, covered cover two type type situation mm-hmm. there. But we got to see a lot more than that, uh, especially as an inside linebacker, as you say, that close to the line of scrimmage. Got to see him playing downhill a lot better than what the way he's been playing. We do, and to me, it's more fundamental. Like, again, the the big plays are are nice and and necessary, but. There's step two. If you if you can't play downhill on a puller, I don't care about the big plays you're going to potentially make. You got to do the, the fundamental things first. And he, I thought, I thought he did that in college. He's not doing that now, and so that's a surprising part to me. But um, yeah, he's got to play better for sure. And I think it goes back to starting with good fundamental football and then building off of that. Got a lot of uh, quarterback names blast from the past. Scott Campbell, which I barely remember. Mm. Scott Campbell. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds like yeah. you remember him. Uh, Jim yeah. Miller. Um, yeah. Cliff Stout. Uh, yeah, so definitely some some names to try to forget some more. Tommy Maddox, Mike Tomzak. Uh, a couple more Campbell, questions. Campbell threw uh, Campbell threw that touchdown pass against the Saints. That uh, was it. The Swan or uh, I forget who? Not not Swan. Uh, uh, was it Lips? And anyway, uh, uh, OJ. Uh, that was I think on Monday Night Football, and I think they were. Uh, I think that one hit the ground. I don't think that one got completed, but uh, he was given credit for it uh, on that. They obviously didn't have replay back. I think I've got that clip floating around <laughs> my Twitter feed somewhere on that. But uh, yeah, that's a blast from the past too, Scott Campbell. MW draft Mr. Jordan Davis or other D line from Georgia, then get Armstrong, the Virginia quarterback. Yeah, I'd love to get Jordan Davis. Uh, he might go higher than where Pittsburgh's picking, but that is a big athletic. Man, uh, in that middle of that Bulldogs defense for sure. Ooh, Good, they got some players on the defensive do, side. Do. Man. You can get that pro day. They sent the whole house to that Georgia pro day oh, this year. Yeah, Kirk, Tomlin, yeah Tomlin, and they know Kirby quite well from over the years yeah. as well. So you can count on them having a uh, a lot of people there uh, in 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 Athens for that pro day for yeah. sure. Uh, MW also says, is that a scheme that Highsmith is playing where he crashes hard inside and then giving up outside? I was taught uh, keep outside arm free and turn runner inside lines was killing us. Running that, yeah, that was the third and nine play of the game, 12, that run left side. That's the wrong arm technique, but there should be someone to spill that to on the outside, and there was no one there. So I don't understand why Highsmith used that technique unless someone screwed up behind him. Lane was in on that play, wasn't he? He was on the tackle, sort of, but, I mean, he's playing on the it's, – it's third and long. He's, he's, you know, focused on the coverage. He's not – uh, right, but I'm saying he what that was that was the play he was in on. What, oh what, yeah, that he actually he, played yeah, his one yeah. play of the game. Yeah, uh, that was his one play. Yeah, right. uh, and Mark Millett, by the way, he played two snaps. I was wrong. He didn't play one. He played two. But Norwood's still the uh, the new slot corner. 
I think it was more question I wanted to get to James B said thoughts on Charlton's play so far. I thought it was, you know, decent. I, I felt like he was having some issues again with that alignment assignment stuff, some of the shifts and motions. I mean, all those guys seem to have problems, but Charlton seemed to be a little more unsure than, than the other guys were. Yeah, he definitely didn't stick out as much he did as he did in that last game on tape, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So but it'll be counted 20, on. Did- twenty three snaps for him and twenty one for Derek Tuska in that game after after you know basically a byproduct of Watt leaving when he did and the game going into overtime. Yeah, Tuska was playing more late. I don't know if that's coincidence or not, but he was playing more late later in that game for whatever that's worth over Charles. Mm. All right, I think it's going to wrap things up here, guys. I appreciate it um, very much, you guys being here. There'll be a replay of this on the channel and on Steelers Depot in a little bit as well. So appreciate you guys being here, hanging out with us. We'll, we'll be back in two weeks. Enjoy Monday Night Football. And Dave, as always, uh, thanks for being here. Thank you for doing this, and thank you, everybody, for showing up. Peace and love, and have a great Monday night. All right, on that note, again, thanks for being here, guys, and we'll talk to you soon.